Content warning. This is a work of commentary of a book that was marketed and sold for young adult audiences of about ages 13 plus. This content is thus appropriate for ages 13 plus. Contents and quotes replicated, they're just all here for constructive commentary purposes. Some of the content may not be appropriate for everyone, so use your own discretion. In particular, there, there will be a lot of discussions of race, indigenous cultural appropriation and racism against, drug abuse, and some sexual content within the book itself. There's also a brief mention of suicide. So, hello. It's been a hot minute there, but, um... Hey, you know, I have to live for a bit, and uh, let's get back into a new year full of some very strange little books. So I um, I spent a lot of my break period reading two books, which um, <laughs> since becoming a YouTuber, as it's called, I have had a lot less time for actually reading books, and um, I've really been choosing some absolute bangers because I read Save the Pearls, and um, Save the Pearls is <laughs> by Victoria Foyt, and it's a very infamous book, and it's so infamously controversial that I feel like most people have heard of it or seen someone else cover it, but here I am, because somehow the most infamously controversial young adult dystopia book of all time was just worse than I thought. And this is saying quite a bit because I have seen a lot, I have read a lot, and I knew what I was getting into with Save the Pearls. Like, it's this YA reverse racism kind of concept, dystopia, where white people who are called pearls are oppressed by black people who are called coals. Like, yeah, they're called coals because of global warming. And this is a book that literally has the main character in blackface on the cover because in-universe there is legally mandated blackface. This is like a book that just triples down on racial stereotypes and cultural appropriation, and yet it's still so much worse than I thought it was or could ever be. Somehow. Like, I'm saying that this is really surprisingly bad and horrible and just bizarre in every way, and I'm saying that as somebody who, like, my brother was into 4chan when I was a kid, so I was exposed to some crazy stuff at a very young age, and Save the Pearls really surprised me. Like, I, I didn't think that I'd ever actually bother reading Save the Pearls, uh, in truth. Uh, it's called Revealing Eden, by the way, or Adapting Eden is the sequel. And I didn't think I'd ever read it. I've said this before, especially to, like, some comments of people suggesting books, which is always really interesting, I do appreciate it. But I'm most interested in very weird and obscure books, and I prefer, like, talking about books that few people have talked about before, or that I feel like hasn't been covered fully in depth. So. For example, um, Perfected, I feel like nobody had, like, pretty much ever heard of Perfected, and a lot of the reviews that existed were very old, and not many of them would go fully in-depth on, like, spoilers and details and deeper analysis, so I really enjoyed the opportunity to kind of be the person to write something very comprehensive on that. And that's sort of the thing that I really enjoy, especially with very bad books. Most of my bad book collection includes things that are extremely obscure, that I will probably not do them on this channel, because I would worry too much about, you know, drawing too much attention to authors who, um, you know, release their self-published really, really bad book that I, I love, but I don't want YouTube's eyes on them. That's sort of the level I usually go at. And it's fun and it's profitable to do, like, a famously bad book, you know, like, I know that Lightlark was at the zeitgeist, which is one of the reasons that I did it. But, you know, for various reasons, a lot of the time, really popular bad books just don't appeal to me. Empress Teresa, for example, is a very popular request I get. And I'm not that interested in trying that book out because it's clearly just like an outlet for some really unchecked mental illness of the author, and I feel like there's not much to comment on about that. And Save the Pearls, you know, it's the same sort of thing where with Save the Pearls I kind of figured that it was just racist book, popular joke subject, not much else to say about it. And then, crucially, I was also like, well, it's about race, so it's primarily better served to actually be discussed by people of color who are affected by racism compared to me. So, you know, as much as I will read books that will address race or have racial issues in them, like, for example, Perfected, which isn't about race, but a lot of my commentary I had to talk about racism and race because that was very relevant to the topic. And I can read books, I can do analysis, I can think about race, but 
ultimately, when it comes to a book that's just about race like that, when it comes to a really deep critical review on it, I kind of feel like my voice is just not going to be quite as worth somebody like a person of color who also is fully capable of reading the book and giving a deep review. So when it came to Save the Pearls, I did pick it up. I was sort of looking for a pick me up over the break and I wasn't sure I would actually do a review. I started reading it and um, it was absolutely wild, but I wasn't sure that it was going to be a main review on this YouTube channel kind of content. Like, yeah, I, I can recount a plot and I can tell you, you know, you know, his, it's really racist and bad. And there's probably worth in, if you like how I do my reviews, it's probably just worth seeing me say even the very obvious things. But it doesn't appeal to me if I don't actually have much constructive and extra to say, you know? So, you know, what's my review worth on the subject if I'm just repeating things other people have said, but some of my impact is just lost? So yeah, I wasn't interested in Save the Pearls, is what I'm trying to say, compared to my 500 other projects I'm working on. But I wound up giving it a go because, you know, I wasn't feeling too good and I knew it would just be like an easy, bad book to make fun of with at least my friends. And hey, really good news, really good news for everybody here. I have a video, you're watching it, and um, I deeply suspect it's going to be at least two hours long because this is an unhinged and bizarre book in so many ways that I had no idea. I mean, it's still racist. It's, it's really, really racist. I mean, the 17-year-old lead character often feels like she's like about to start writing her whites-only manifesto. But there's just so much else that I never heard about when it came to Save the Pearls. Like, I just didn't know about the sudden magic or the um, many new and even more groundbreaking ways of being racist. I mean, the world building is just so flimsy that it has to be held up by both Dwayne Sex Machina plants and Dwayne Sex Machina Aztecs. There's ludicrous drug abuse. And there's a man who is somehow both too furry and too human for my comfort. And of course, let's not forget the incredibly sexually charged piggyback rides, which is, um, this isn't a book about racism, it's a book about piggyback rides. So yeah, um, I'm really excited to try and tell you about this absolute wildness with, um, so many quotes with page number sources because some of them, I just feel like you will not believe me about the contents of what goes on in this. Gosh. <laughs> How many times had Eden heard it? White people were lazy good-for-nothings with weak genetics. Maybe a solar flare caused a technical glitch? Eden tried to control the hysteria rising in her. I swear my report is there. Ashina jumped up and grabbed Eden's lab coat. Are you calling me a liar? Eden flinched. One of them was touching her. White hot light exploded in her head. Before she knew it, she blurted out an incendiary racial slur. Get your hands off me, you damn coal. Page 10. So, Save the Pearls, technically called Revealing Eden Save the Pearls, is a self-published, using the author's own vanity press, young adult dystopia set in a post-apocalyptic, extremely racist world. After the Great Meltdown, which might have been a war and might be climate change, the sun became a deadly laser that gives everybody instant skin cancer. Because of this, millions died at rates depending on skin color, leaving whites as the lowest population and now lowest class. Black people, meanwhile, are the highest population and the highest caste. It's worth noting that the logic of this is extremely flawed. In general, the world building, as I'll explain throughout, is deeply broken to a degree it's clear that this is just sort of a victimization fantasy, like that came before any sort of logic. The book suggests that the sun's UV is now so intense everyone dies in their early 30s, especially white people, and the main factor that this society is built on is melanin content. Melanin is what produces pigment in human skin and does factor into UV radiation resistance, but the extreme protection someone with darker skin has over lighter skin, this book says it's extreme, it's not necessarily that dramatic. I suffered through a fair amount of academic, like, papers and stats on the subject, and um, I'm not very good at that, and obviously it's rather difficult to get that information if you're not in those fields. And basically, 
what we know about UV light um, skin cancer and melanin is not necessarily conclusive in any clear way. Like, we don't have any proof that skin cancer is dramatically affected by race or by melanin in skin. And it's also a very well-known negative myth that black people are, like, immune to the dangers of the sun or resist it. In truth, a lot of the times, uh, skin cancer and other skin conditions are misdiagnosed or missed with people with darker skin color because the uh, scientific models and things are usually based off of people of white skin. And when it came down to looking at scientific papers on the subject, I found that a lot of the population pools would be, um, one of the first ones I found was a poll sort of thing relating to skin cancer affected by like race ethnicity. And the sample sizes were 75,000 people total, which is a very large amount. That's a good amount for a study. But 71%, uh, 71%, 71,000 of those 75,000 were white people. And in that survey, which is a CDC official one, that is one of the first results when you start looking into stats on this, it's like 300 black people, 71,000 white people. So that's just not going to give you an accurate like information about skin cancer rates relating to melanin or race or ethnicity because there's so many other factors that go into that. Just social factors, um, environmental factors, just everything matters on that. So what I'm trying to say is that um, if the sun does go beast mode on us, we are all doomed and it's not going to create this dramatic reverse pyramid. In this world though, uh, that's what we have. Humanity lives underground in vast tunnel systems away from the sun, with very few people ever seeing the surface, and white people outright banned even at night due to the risk of just the skin cancer. Despite this shelter, everyone is still dying of skin cancer, suggesting that the sun is just seriously pissed off. We don't have any idea how big this underground city is, if it's the only one, how anything works, but we do know the universal government enforces forced mating. So, girls by 18 and men by 24 must find a mutual partner to mate with, producing a child. Mating isn't like marriage, which is considered outdated, and many couples just sort of break off after they mate. If you fail to find a mate, however, you are left to die. Uh, the other key aspect of this world is, of course, the racial caste system. They're not called castes, um, it's not actually a caste system, but it's sort of the best way I can describe it. White people aren't actually slaves, like I assumed when I first heard of the book. They're pretty well treated. Everybody gets free food, medication, home, but they do kind of still sit at the bottom. They're called pearls, often, which we're told is a slur. And in fact, every race has its own slur, because, <laughs> you know, we needed more of those. So coal, for black people, we're told in book one this is a slur. We also have amber for Asians and tiger's eye for Latino. And then there's no other mention of any other ethnicities or races. And even then, as we probably all know by now, race is a very arbitrary thing that is relatively new in historic senses and constantly changing. So, you know, it, it's all nonsense. Breaking the rock theme, by the way, the now eugenically extinct albinos are cotton, while gingers are the lowest of the low as pink pearls. <laughs> so, hmm. Okay, I'm supposed to be jumping straight into plot, but I do need to jump in really early here and address something super obvious. Everybody says this point, and everyone must make this point. It's occurred to you, it's occurred to everybody. There's just something very wrong with this naming system. Book two tries to backtrack and cover it, but it's just very clear to anybody that Pearl is a pretty, delicate, good term, and coal is a dirty, ugly, bad thing. So in book one, they're meant to be slurs, but they're pretty much always used by the narration and the characters and count much more like their official group titles. There's no world, though, where coal, especially coal, doesn't feel like a real-life slur against black people now. And in book two, to just hastily cover her tracks, the author says that Pearl is a slur, it's an insult, because they're worthless, you know, old world fragile things. And coal is a compliment, because coals like turn into diamonds and they represent useful fuel commodities. And, um, you know, I wonder how useful the fuel commodity of coal is in a world where everything runs on solar power. It's also a very weak explanation, just in general, but also because, if we remember, 
albinos, who are so low of the low that they were eugenically wiped out, were called cotton, which is something that is extremely useful. Cotton is one of the best things we got for, like, a good clothing source. We're probably not using coal in this apocalyptic future, we probably are using cotton, and yet cotton is the lowest of the low and a slur. So, yeah, her internal logic doesn't make sense, the external logic doesn't make sense, this explanation is just so weak. It contradicts canon, um, where in book one it says coal is a slur and now it's a compliment. And yeah, just sort of get used to a lot of lore contradictions and lore just not making sense between these two books. A familiar rush of pleasure mixed with fear coursed through her at the sight of the white girl. Images of pearls in natural coloring were forbidden. If they caught Eden looking, she would be punished. Page 6. So Eden Newman is our hero, and Eden Newman is turning 18, so she's afraid for her life if she doesn't find a mate. She and her dad work in a lab for Bramford Industries, a cushy role that her dad gets because of his brilliance. Though Eden and him, as all pearls, wear black makeup at all times and are the lowest of the low. The excuse for this is that of cultural beauty, with black people now being the highest caste, being white is seen as really ugly. But somehow, even weirder than just like this culturally mandated blackface is the fact that Eden says it's primarily to avoid antagonizing the Coles. Meaning it's not culturally mandated, it is in fact government mandated blackface. Her father's research is on genetics, specifically a project to mutate human DNA with animal DNA in order to make humanity better suited for the wastelands of the surface. This involves using panther, harpy eagle, and anaconda DNA, primarily relying on the melanism of the panther to darken the skin and add like extra UV resistance. The goal is for everybody, regardless of race, to ideally receive this so that they can again live on the surface, you know, and adapt to this new world. Eden has a potential mate named Jamal, who works in a lab as a guard. They haven't officially declared it as such, but they meet up on like the world band or the internet to like make out and flirt. They're sort of dating. Jamal is a coal, so Eden doesn't know why he'd be interested in her, but she's just happy that she might be able to avoid the um, dying when you turn 18 thing if you haven't got laid. Jamal invites her to the government-mandated monthly moon dance, something that she takes as a sign he's going to propose mating. And in the um, midst of this like basic setup for the start of the book, I want to note something about Eden. So Eden is racist, like not even in this oppressed person hates oppressors way, where we might feel weird like reading a white person hating black people, but in context it kind of makes sense. But no, instead Eden just reads like a diary of a white supremacist. Like she constantly calls black people them, like in italics, finding them disgusting, terrifying, she's deeply afraid of them. She sort of longs for this time where white people can exist in theory as equals, but something about her daydreaming just sounds much more like she longs for a time where white people are dominant, as it were. Often you can place Eden in modern day and find that her thoughts are just at home and even more logical as a modern day racist than like here in the book in this alternate world. Like, read this quote and tell me that this just doesn't sound like somebody today being really racist, okay? She suspected that each and every coal passerby wanted to hurt her, even though the statistical odds against that were high. And her censors, which automatically translated the babble of foreign languages into English, the official language, told her it wasn't true. Still, she could never shake the fear of being among so many of them. 33 to 34. So. Eden takes the train down to the dance, but she finds herself followed by two grunts of the Federation of Free People, or the FFP. The FFP serve as the series' closest thing to villains, but very loosely. They're this all-cold terrorist group who wants to kill all the pearls, and their uniform of paramilitary jackets and black berets is like a bit too eerily similar to the Black Panthers. Mm, you know? The FFP men grab her and hold her hostage, grabbing at her as Eden remembers this childhood nursery rhyme about pearls being raped by coals, and that nursery rhyme is so bad, I'm not going to read it or put it here, I just want you to know that it exists and that the author wrote a nursery rhyme about rape and put it in the book, just for no extra reason. Great. At the moon dance, um, Eden is still being held hostage, and she can't see Jamal anywhere. She struggles to escape the FFP, 
And then suddenly, her dad's boss, Bramford, of Bramford Industries, shows up and saves her. Bramford is 22 and very hot, but Eden considers him to just be this stuck-up ass. He's the one who sponsored the whole genetic program, and he's really rich, but really mysterious, you know. He kidnaps Eden himself, great, saying Jamal was actually a member of the FFP, who only dated her so she'd reveal confidential science information about the project he's working on. Since Eden has given Jamal all of this confidential information, they have to rush back to the lab to stop him. There they find that the FFP has taken the two Pearl test subjects that they've been prepping for, and Bramford orders the experiment to be tested on him instead, immediately. Meanwhile, Eden just sneaks off and bumps into Jamal, who explains his really villainous motive. Except I kind of find his villainous motive to be not very villainous. I kind of wonder what your thoughts are on this, because let me tell you. The Federation of Free People is taking back what greed suckers like Bramford owe us. With your father's technology, we'll be in charge of everything. For Earth's sake, this isn't political. It's about science. Everything is political. The population is controlled by doped oxy and emotionally driven campaigns so the super rich like Bramford can skim cream off the top. Same old story. Eden really couldn't argue with that. But who is to say a new regime wouldn't also abuse their power? Page 60. So I find Jamal's kind of talk here and motives deeply confusing. In general, both books have this serious issue with, like, motivations and goals. The Yuga, for example, kills people who don't mate, but also demands everybody mates. But also demands everybody mates once and only one child is allowed. Do they want more population or do they want less population? The FFP wants to kill all pearls or at least oppress them even more, but their interest in this animal hybrid project is to use it to keep Kull's superior, something that right now there's no doubt over because literally in the fiction of this book, Kull's are superior, they have more UV re resistance. That and the FFP is anti-corruption for some reason. The FFP talk in this communist way too, where they're constantly saying like, we are the people, we're doing this for the people, it's the people's will, which further kind of confuses the pot. The fact that they're this terrorist group when they mostly line up with the current mainstream also doesn't quite add up. Majority hate groups exist, but the FFP is seen as these hated rebels scorned by the YouGov, despite the YouGov enforcing a strict racial caste that is perfectly aligned with their views. The YouGov doesn't want to kill all pearls for whatever reason, but otherwise, the FFP and the YouGov are very similar. So the fact that the FFP is seen as hated rebels just doesn't make sense. And I think that all of this mishmash and confusion makes so much sense when you consider the alternative. Obviously, the FFP should have been white. Radical terrorist cells like this are usually motivated by injustice perceived or not and revenge against the state kind of things. Um, obviously, there's a very wide range, but general. But the FFP just isn't very radical. They're not going against anything that most people disagree with. A bunch of pearls, though, resisting the caste system and hearkening back to the old days of white supremacy, that feels fitting, especially with the interest in hybrid DNA as a way to evolve and not have the biological weakness of low melanin weakening them, you know? Their interest in politics, too, makes more sense, as all of the rich and politicians in this world are Coles, so a Pearl group would have no reason to think that Bramford would treat them any better than any of the other Coles with this technology. Story-wise, too, while I'm giving notes, it makes way more sense to have Eden as a Pearl contend with the idea that Pearls aren't automatically good because they're like her and oppressed, and that it's the ideology and the personhood that matters. In book two, there is actually a white terror cell, and we're gonna get there, but the FFP really shouldn't have been black. So why are the FFP instead these Black Panther reminding black people? Well, you know, <laughs> like, come on. Bramford rushes the experiment ahead as the FFP blow up the office. This explosion, however, makes the science work better. Like, literally in the book, it's just like, the explosion and the fire made the science stronger. Great. And somehow, instead of getting a little bit of animal DNA, he winds up this veritable manimal. Like, uncomfortably anthro, this new form is what the book is about more than anything. Definitely more than race. It's all about the furry pecs. It's just all furry from here on out, baby. 
He reminded Eden of his new cousin, the Jaguar. In the slash of cheekbones and feline face, the resemblance was unmistakable. His eyes, now a luminous deep green, gleamed cat-like in the glow of the fire. No longer bald, he had silky hair tumbling down his shoulders. Powerful, carved legs ripped through his surgical pants. His skin turned so dark it blended with his camouflage spots, giving the impression of muted scars or tattoos all over his body. He shook with rage. The shirt split across the chest, revealing tight bands of muscle underneath a light mat of fur. Slowly, he turned over his hands, examining the thick, padded palms. 68 to 69. Nice. So Ronson Bramford, by the way, his name is Ronson Bramford, the least sexy name there is, is now an anthro cat man, but not in the way anyone would want. I mean, the best part of being an animal hybrid is the ears and wings and tail, right? Like, everybody knows that. Yet he's this man-like dude with a light amount of fur. He's a few feet taller and he's just crazy ripped. Him growing straight long hair is the most offensive of the changes. Like, which animal, anaconda, harpy eagle, or panther, which one gives you the type A luscious locks? Bramford beats up the FFP and flees, taking Eden and her dad with him on a private jet. Though he seems way more like feral and animalistic, Bramford can still speak and acts entirely as just a sentient man. It's clear he's just still himself. Despite this, Eden spends the entire time thinking of him as this brutal piece where she hopes that she can be rid of him or kill him or bang because she's just deeply, deeply attracted to him as well. While here, uh, Bramford removes her internet-enabling earring called a life band so that they can't be tracked. The fact that they're in a plane also is confusing, and the world building just about to get worse. Going in a hot tin can closer to the deadly rays of the sun is idiotic, especially if the sun is giving people hundreds of feet underground severe skin cancer. But then they land in the Amazon rainforest, which is fine. <laughs> The Amazon is um, notoriously a very, you know, sensitive environment that doesn't handle the uh, climate change that we currently have very well, but in this world, it's fine. Earlier, we heard that the surface of the Earth was this barren, patchy wasteland. Eden, as a child, went to a special viewing dome and literally saw a pile of bleached bones like it was some cartoon desert. Despite there being nothing on the surface, we're also told that some people do go up there at night. And also here, the Amazon is fine. And this is where Save the Pearls really begins. Because this is the secret. This is not a book about a racist dystopia. It's a book about a furry and a girl hate loving each other in the Amazon. I mean, there's still racism though, but like, don't worry, they're gonna switch it up for us, okay? Let me, let me, let me get you some. Let me read you some, okay? She didn't think things could get any worse when the welcoming committee came into view. A half dozen short, muscular Indians wearing a ragtag assortment of clothes stood by a line of ancient all-terrain vehicles. The Wurani, Eden's father said excitedly. Who? The world's last independent indigenous tribe. Page 99. Yeah, so along for this new part of the book is the Hurani, Wurani, a real tribe from the Amazon whose name I'm trying to pronounce the best I can. Young adult fiction has this severe issue with freely taking and misrepresenting the cultures of indigenous tribes, so you know that this book is no better. From constantly calling them Indians to, well, um, okay, let me paraphrase a little bit. So the Wurani fall to their knees and start chanting at Bramford. Eden's dad says, they think you're El Tigre, the jaguar man. Imagine the long-awaited Aztec god. Now the tribesmen looked at her with equal reverence. See, Dot, her father added, you're divine by association with El Tigre. 103. Yeah, so our main characters are constantly worshipped as gods by the indigenous people around them, and in book two are basically confirmed as gods. The Wurani have faced immense damage from colonialization, and they're a rather small, isolated people from Ecuador. There's not an immense amount of stuff really known about them because they are quite isolationists, and all of the sources that I could find are also, many of them are quite old. However, from what I could do for my research, confirm that of course this El Tigre stuff is completely bunk. The jaguar is a very sacred animal to them, as it is to many tribes in the Amazonian region, but Save the Pearls posits that this great jaguar man, who they've long expected to save them, is going to show up, and that story is just simply false. 
Eden's dad also connects them to the Aztecs, and while a lot of indigenous people of South America can be linked to the Aztecs just by virtue of time and location, you know, the Hurani are not connected to the Aztecs. Nor do the Aztecs, for that matter, have a specific jaguar man the savior. They also found the jaguar to be a sacred animal, and they have several gods who are jaguar related, but none of them fit this bill. Like, really, I don't know if I need to say this. If you're not from an indigenous group, you shouldn't be writing about that group's religion, culture, or life, honestly. Like, have they not suffered enough? Just every indigenous group ever has suffered, it seems. And it's just extra annoying here because the author has obviously read about the Hurani. There's a number of very specific details showing that she's at least read the Wikipedia article beyond taking the name, with certain words, traditions, and religious ideas being accurate. I mean, there's not a lot of detail on them, but they're approximately accurate. She just also needed to make her leads gods, and she edited in a press group's belief system to do so. It's horrible. The Wurani are in both groups as just supporting cast, none of them really standing out, but they're still humanized as people, while also still kind of acting as alien foreign savages who are stuck in the uncivilized past. Adding to that is the fact that Eden doesn't speak their language, which you might expect, but just any other language but English. So often her father luckily will speak the language, and later Aztecs get involved and he speaks their language too. But Eden, who is often just on her own meeting people, only knows English, never learns anything more, and thus communicates to people mostly just through gestures and trying to say things in English and assuming she understands, sometimes with a tiny bit of broken Spanish in there. It's very annoying and just sort of adds to the feeling that all of our indigenous characters, which we wind up with quite a lot, are just sort of extra props or like weird NPCs that just aren't able to fully be people because they aren't even allowed to speak properly. So anyways, the Wurani start leading Eden, Bramford, and Eden's ever unnamed dad to their village deep in the forest. At this point, like, Eden still really doesn't want to be here, and she plans to escape and calls for help on this, like, stolen life band. She's just looking for the opportunity to call for help. At this point, one point, this results in her falling off of a cliff into a river, and Bramford goes in to save her. This action that separates them from the group, and also cleans off her black face, which she's been in this whole time. So, they're alone in the Amazon, and that can only mean one thing. Extremely horny shoulder piggyback rides. <laughs> I don't know the proper term for this, when I say piggyback ride, she is sitting on his shoulders. Not quite what a normal piggyback ride is, but there's not really a term for that, so we're gonna go with shoulder piggyback rides. Eden tentatively wrapped her legs around his broad back, barely able to encircle his girth. In spots, Bramford's downy fur rubbed against her skin, surprisingly pleasant. A faint shudder ran through her. She began to slip backwards as he sped towards the forest. To stop herself from falling, she squeezed her legs tight around him. Once again, she thought she heard him purr. 124. Deeply sexual piggyback rides are a staple of these books. You know, I'm always really careful to tell people, like, don't ascribe an author's kink, like, or personality traits off of their books. You really can't say that you know an author's kinks or even their personality based on a work of fiction. Especially because a lot of people, a lot of you lovely people, are very bad at it. Um, people just sort of bombastically decide that one weird thing is the like a hint of a fetish, when really the hallmarks of a fetish are just clearly missing from that scenario. Take Perfected, the human pet books, if that author had been into pet play, there'd be way more situations that aligned with that. There'd be more in her writing that would reflect the fact that she finds this interesting, interesting, in a way that many people do not. It would stand out in a very specific way. She had every excuse to put her lead on a leash and, like, make her crawl, but the books never focused on the pet aspects, the aspects that somebody with that kink would be into. The author of Save the Pearls, though, has a thing for piggyback rides. I hate to do this, but I've read both books, and by your third deeply thirsty piggyback riding scene, you are clearly finding something hot here that the average bear just is not. I've never heard of this as a kink, and now I'm too aware of how and why someone would be very, very aroused by such a thing. Because that's what this book is about. Sexual piggyback rides, a little bit of pony play hinting, you know, just a bit, 
And um, keep an eye out for that, because I will quote it whenever it happens, and the last one is so sexually charged, it reads 100% like a sex scene without context. I, I will remind you before and after, it's not a sex scene, and you will not believe me, and I am not joking. Bramford and Eden eventually make it to the village, and the plot pretty much stops at this point. In the village, there's this lab and a locked hut, showing Bramford has had this, like, secret brace here for some time. Eden is still relatively sure she wants to escape or call for help, all while ping-ponging on, like, hating Bramford or loving him. Bramford does the same to Eden, while the main couple's, of, like, opinions of each other are changing multiple times within the same scene, and it's just incredibly irritating. They just hate each other, they love each other, they're attracted to each other, they hate each other. It's the worst. Eden's dad then announces that the furry transformation is irreversible, and will maybe even continue until Bramford is way more animal than man. Bramford thus decides he wants to speed up the transformation and just become a super panther rather than remain a sexy furry. To do this, he needs to kill a panther, a harpy eagle, and an anaconda to harvest more DNA, because science. Eden runs away into the jungle and gets attacked by an anaconda, a scene that I'd pretty much skip if not for these wildly inaccurate things that this giant snake does. Firstly, in Anaconda, it's pretty much not going to prey on a human like this. Um, there's been accounts that they maybe have, but no, not really. And then secondly, let me read this. Um, the Anaconda whipped its long tail into an upright S shape, flinging Eden free. The snake dunked her underwater and then swung her high in the air. Eden watched in amazement as Bramford thrust his captured arm deep into his foe's jaws. Only one man wielded such counterintuitive intelligence, she thought proudly. And it worked. The anaconda flung open its jaws with a gagging sound. Bramford was free. In a blur, he butted his head between the snake's eyes and it fell into a heap. Its thrashing tail grew still. The reptilian giant fell into the river, pulling Eden down with it. 191 to 192 with a couple sentences omitted because it was boring. So, um, I'm not a snake person, or a snurson, but I don't think this is very snake accurate, or snackurate. Eden breaks a few ribs, but is fine, and also does this. Eden licked tiny beads of water that clung to the hairs on his chest with the tip of her tongue. His full-throated rumbling sounded full of yearning. She threw her arms around his neck with a little cry. Pulling her tight against his body, he groaned heavily. 194. At this point, Bramford leaves Eden in the jungle for a day to go harvest some um, psychoactive plants and get really high. Bramford as a character isn't very well defined before his transformation, but he suddenly becomes deeply spiritual, often being called a shaman by just the book, the narrative, other people, and especially Eden. We know that he's had a secret house here in the village with the Hurani, but we don't know how often he's been by or how long he's known them. So it appears in the text that becoming a furry has made him deeply religious. He trips while Eden lies there with some broken ribs, hallucinating a lot of just background exposition. So, it turns out Bramford had a mate named Rebecca, who looked identical to Eden. He mistakes Eden for her while tripping, and even kisses her, calling, like, Eden his mate, but he means Rebecca. Rebecca, however, was evil, and hired by the FFP to seduce Bramford to get Bramford's research, as well as expose his secrets. Rebecca, knowingly or not, had a secret recessive albino gene, which meant, like, it was supposed to have been wiped out, but she secretly had recessive albinism. And Bramford also has secret albinism as a recessive gene. They conceived a child who wound up being albino, something that is so illegal and hated that earlier in the book, Bramford watches a news report about an albino child being burned alive at the stake. Rebecca then was held hostage by the FFP in exchange for their son, but Bramford refused, leaving Rebecca to die. It's a rather confusing story, just motivation-wise, but I cannot explain it any better. Oh well, let's just go back to another horny piggyback ride, please. Let's just do that. She dared to test the boundaries of their body language and flexed her thighs around his neck. Unbelievably, his gait slowed. A feverish thrill shot through Eden. She could guide Bramford with a mere squeeze. Did she dare push him further? She couldn't resist the wild urge to flick her hips against his shoulders. At once he picked up speed. She almost squealed. His raw animal power was at her command. Eden pressed her body against the back of Bramford's powerful head, rocking to the rhythm of his quick pace. A gush of pleasure swept through her, like fire and ice, like sweet, dripping honey. 
Again, she pushed her hips, harder now, and waited breathlessly. He tightened his hold on her legs and the heat from his fingers burning into her as he sped faster. Eden laughed, though she hardly recognized the lush, throaty sounds. In response, Bramford let out an amorous growl that echoed in the trees and rained down on her delirium. She felt melded to him, no longer a mismatched centaur-like creature but a single being. There was no question in her mind that he also felt their deep connection. 267. That's a piggyback ride. There is nothing else going on there. They return to the village, and Eden finds Bramford's son, Logan, is kept in this locked-up hut in the village. Like, he leaves at night, but otherwise never can appear, because he's albino, but also it kind of appears like he's just locked up there, because no one really mentions him, no one seems to hang out with him, there's no mention that this child is being cared for at all, besides the fact that he just lives in this hut in the middle of the Amazon. It doesn't seem like Bramford is a very good father, is what I'm saying. So Eden lures Logan out and finds that, like, he wears all-black clothing, he only comes out at night, he wears a mask, and she removes the mask and she just screams when she realizes he's an albino, as at this point she doesn't know that he's albino. And even though being albino is like a cursed bad thing, Eden has spent the latter half of this book assuring us how much she's changed and that she's like a she-cat and wild and free. And despite all of those changes, she sees this shy, isolated boy about seven years old and she screams in shock at the sight of him. Like, that's just not very she-cat of you, I would say. <laughs> so, for some reason... Eden, in her eternal love-hate with Bramford, about this time finally uses her stolen life band to call for help. Eden's dad is sick, so Bramford and Eden go on a quest to climb a mountain and harvest a sacred healing herb, because, like, why not? I mean, we're nearly at the end of the book, there's no plot in this book, there's no threads to hold on to. The whole Bramford questing to become a full animal is just fully forgotten by now. Pearl Cole racism isn't important, just nothing is. They climb the mountain, and recall at this point Eden still has multiple broken ribs, and then they make out in a scene that I thought was for sure a sex scene until book two. Like, seriously, there's sex scenes in book two, and they are hilarious. But the author's main writing gift is writing things that aren't sex like they are. Like, I'm gonna read this and tell me that this doesn't sound like they're having sex, because they're not. I like it, she repeated, hugging him. That's because you're my she-cat. Bramford nuzzled her neck, then traced a line up to her lips. With soft licks, he parted her mouth. Heat blazed like wildfire through her body. Her mind went blank as he kissed her, deeply. Eden closed her eyes, giving in to his hungry demands. Their limbs intertwined until her body molded to his. She sank into a river of bliss that swept her outside of time, outside of any barriers, real or imagined, into a place where she thought anything was possible, even a future together. When he released her, she knew she would never be the same. 280. Eden tries to thus immediately throw away her life band, but then she's caught by Bramford, immediately, who now again hates her. So, like, all of that is just done with. At this point, um, there's a pointed line noting that he piggybacks, carries her off the mountain, and it isn't horny at all. Like, that's how severe this chasm in their relationship apparently is. When they return, the FFP are at the village holding everyone hostage because we need a climax. They capture Bramford and things seem hopeless. Jamal shows up and he's now ugly with a scar to show he's evil and says that he wants to forcibly mate with Eden after all. And as a peace offering, he's brought Eden's dog, Austin. I didn't mention the dog before. I didn't mention the dog before because, well, the dog isn't important. And when the lab explodes way back then, it's kind of implied that the dog also exploded. It's not really passive. It's very passive. The lab explodes. We never hear about the dog. We kind of can assume that along with all of her possessions, the dog exploded. And, you know, that was really rough. But I was like, I can just cut that. And then here we learn the dog is fine. Eden rejects Jamal and he goes to shoot her and thus immediately her dog jumps in front of the laser and dies again, which is the absolutely the funniest choice you could possibly make to kill a dog, reveal that the dog is fine, and then immediately kill the dog <laughs> again. <laughs> okay, so suddenly Aztec warriors appear and take out all the FFP and leave with other word. Like, seriously, we, we first get the dog ex machina, now there's an Aztec ex machina, and this all spans in, like, the, like in two paragraphs. All of this goes down, by the way. And then the book ends. 
<laughs> the Aztecs had yet to be seen, but were very vaguely hinted at, like Bramford was like, we're being watched. But there's no mention of the Aztecs before, not enough foreshadowing, and then suddenly they just pop out, like shoot some darts at the FFP, and then disappear without a word. And in the epilogue, we learn that the magic herb that like saved Eden's dad's life also saved the dog's life, so he's back. It's been a week and life is good, and the final action in the story is Eden just convincing her dad to finally stop wearing blackface. <laughs> you know, just to bring everything to a close, all we've learned. <laughs> Oh boy! Book one is done. But we still have book two ahead, which will take some bizarre turns, including more cultural appropriation, sudden magic, accidental severe homoeroticism, and some fantastic furry jungle sex. Like, I thought I'd do a couple asides in between, and firstly I want to talk about the relationship at the heart of the story, which very much is the story, Bramford and Eden. And, you know, man, one of my most hated tropes is the one where the love interest, like, looks like their boyfriend's last girlfriend or is, like, them reincarnated. So the Rebecca thing just irritates me off there. It just feels like it devalues the initial connection, especially as every one of those stories is the exact same arc of the man realizing that this girl is different and better in some way or unique from, you know, the last girlfriend. It's just deeply boring and mainly unimportant. So, Save the Pearls, though, if you didn't spot it, is a Beauty and the Beast retelling. It took me kind of a long time to see that. Obviously, it's a girl and a beastly man, so the parallel was there, I noticed that, but the rest of the story follows Beauty and the Beast as well. Bramford is an apparently beastly man before he turns into an animal, who abducts our beauty, a girl who is different and ostracized by others, to a remote place that he refuses to let her leave. He also abducts her father, a socially inept scientist. Along the way, Eden sees Bramford as more than a beast and no longer feels she's kidnapped, especially after an incident where he saves her from wild animals. Adding to this is Jamal, who is our Gaston. He's an apparently heroic, attractive man who's the true villain and shows up to hunt the beast. This also rather implies that the Wurani are a bunch of talking furniture, but for the depth they get, they might as well be. Eden and Bramford, though, somehow avoid the obvious relationship arc of this premise. As much as Eden starts out hating him and ends up loving him, their actual opinions are annoyingly like inconsistent. Eden finds him attractive and feels a deep connection, but in the drop of the hat plans to defy him and vows to escape. He saves her from a snake, and she vows to never be apart from him, then a sentence later just despises him. She lays on the jungle floor and he brings her food, but she kicks it away when he tells her to eat, saying, don't tell me what to do. It's just one of the most irritating relationships I've ever had to read. And it's the same with Bramford, of course. He's caring or he's stuck up, he's taunting her for being out of sync with nature and then purring loudly when she licks her chest. He loves her and then he hates her, and there somehow is not one point in the plot where they meet a final opinion and remain there. While they're on the mountain, they're deeply in love, but then he quickly is angry about the life band. Then all of that is forgotten when they save the village from the FFP. There isn't even a resolution before the climax shows up and the epilogue right after, leaving their relationship just so poorly defined that like the last solid opinion expressed between them is pretty much hatred. Their inconsistent natures are the only thing getting in the way, too. There aren't any other obstacles between them. Like, in the book plot, there's no obstacles. In their relationship, there's no obstacles besides each other. Like, what does Bramford need to do to get with Eden? I don't know. What does Eden need to do? Like, just nothing. Like, and keenly, and probably most importantly, race has nothing to do with it. I think that if I was to run a poll on this book, most people would know it about, like, being about racism and blackface. That's what it's most famous for, and I initially knew that the black love interest was part animal, not that he was a furry. And even then, I thought that the part animal aspect was a fairly small detail and more racist than anything else, pulling to the racist ideas of like black men as animalistic and violent. Instead, one of the most shocking aspects of this book, famously about race, is that it isn't about race at all. We begin in the tunnels, and we're hit hard with it, but the black-white reverse racism premise ends at that point. We get some indigenous racism as a bonus, like, sure, but not to the degree any more than any other bad YA from that era that is appropriating indigenous cultures. And as I was thinking about all of this, I realized something extremely important. 
race doesn't actually matter to any aspect of the book. It doesn't matter in the world building, I'll get there, the premise, the relationships, the struggles, you can erase race and the book will be exactly the same. And this sounds really radical because again, the whole premise is save the pearls, pearls and coals, the sun's deadly lasers. But hear me out. If instead of race, we simply had rich and poor people, what would change? If instead of blackface, Eden had a large birthmark that she hid with makeup, absolutely nothing is different in this scenario. Bramford still has an albino son that he wants to add some animal DNA to to protect him. Eden still struggles to find a mate because the government dating site requires no makeup to hide her birthmark and people are judgmental. Terrorists still want to steal the animal DNA project so the rich won't abuse it, leading to Bramford winding up as a beast hiding in the Amazon. Eden's makeup washes off on the river and she learns to love her natural appearance. How much different is that, really? The only thing that would change is I wouldn't have read this book, and no one would have read this book, and book three would exist, probably. The book would still be bad, because there's so many flaws in it, not to mention the indigenous racism, that, you know, there's just so many things wrong with it on every critical level. But we wouldn't know about it like we do. Save the Pearls was published via a press the author set up, making it actually self-published, and distributed by her sending out copies to reviewers. We wouldn't know about it if it wasn't for the wild racism, like no matter how strange all the furry stuff is and everything else. Even the author is quite aware that race is not the theme of the book. The book is about, like, impossible to track down, and I didn't want to buy it physically for 30 plus dollars, so I went looking for a digital copy. There's no official ebook, however, so you can't even really pirate it. Eventually I found a link to a PDF of um, James Tulios, actually, who also did a review on this, uh, which I didn't know about before I started reading it, who photographed every single page into a PDF. And uh, that copy of the book is signed, and the thing that it's signed with is Embrace Your Unique Beauty. That's what the author writes. Because, well, the book is about beauty vaguely, not race. Eden is ashamed of being white in the way someone might be self-conscious about a birthmark, and some vague message within is about learning to love herself for being white, I guess. Like, it's only about beauty-ish. So like, why is race here at all? It's a tough question, and I don't know a lot about the author. From what she's written, she's defended herself as not racist, saying a reason that race matters in her story is, well, because if the sun did become a deadly laser, people with light skin would die off more. If we accept that as true, probably isn't, it still doesn't answer why the premise is then that all the black people left would set up a strict racial hierarchy, besides the assumption that this is what a majority does. I believe that the author wants white people to think about race and assumes the best way to write it is a narrative to scare them. You know, a what if you were a slave type story. And this isn't a new idea in the least and can be done in many ways, such as stories where like everybody is gay and heterosexuals are oppressed. Most of the time this style isn't effective at teaching empathy and winds up feeling more offensive than not. The author of Save the Pearls reveals a lot of unintentional racism while trying to put out something she believes would actively be anti-racist. Calling her racist isn't quite fair, but calling her work and her ideas racist is fair because goddamn look at it. And it's um worth noting that reverse racism and even like a thing like the very silly idea of like everybody's gay but heterosexuals are oppressed, those aren't inherently flawed ideas. Like, the thing is, many things can be done good and can be good. Like, if they're done well, they can be good. That's the case of pretty much any premise. I talked about with Perfected, uh, about the human pet book, how actually a human pet dystopia totally can be a really good way to examine a lot of various different things if it's handled by a skilled author, and um, the author of this book is not skilled. So, for example, with reverse racism, which is very bombastic as an idea, well, Knots and Crosses is a series I haven't read by Mallory Blackman, which is an alternative history that we would thus call, like, reverse racism, where white people are the oppressed minority. I can't comment on it because I just don't know that much, but I know it's been long well received, it had a television adaption recently, I'm sure there's flaws, but overall it's, you know, we're not all throwing cancelling cards at this one because it's a way to examine race and race relations if you decide to actually examine race and race relations, where here it's much more an accessory to the story. So 
you know, there's also a couple very key differences between the two authors that might help, and um, I wonder if you can guess. Honestly, I don't think I need to add much more on the racism in this book. I've pointed out as we've gone, and I hope you can just spot it, but I also want to note some just basic gems. It's like the multiple odd food choices for skin tone comparisons, such as raisin colored, and even cafe au lot? I don't know how you even say that French term, but you know, like, fancy coffee. I thought Perfected had just sort of toppled expectations with their freshly toasted bread as a person of color skin comparison. As said, Bramford definitely falls into this racist idea of an aggressive, animalistic black man. Literally being an animal is no excuse, and he feels like this very fetishistic idea of a noble, beastly savage, despite starting out as a millionaire CEO. He's wild and unpredictable and randomly violent. He, you know, runs around quite early on in the book only in a loincloth being extremely ripped, you know, and um, hard to control except for, you know, the one girl who can tame this savage beast. Eden, you know, starts out viewing him as a horrible, dangerous monster, even when he's still talking completely normal and is clearly himself and civilized. And, um, the central thesis itself, talking about racism, feels racially charged in a way I don't think it realizes. The assumption the author makes is that, indeed, if white people were to suddenly become a minority, they would be oppressed. They're not slaves, but they're so persecuted black people force them to wear blackface. This idea that black people would, if only given the chance, oppress white people and erase their rights and identity is really troublingly racist. As said, a lot of Eden's talk feels like she belongs in modern times as a white supremacist, but more specifically, a lot of this book feels like justification for racism now. The assumption that if suddenly the numbers were switched, white people would be treated as they historically have treated others. It's a great replacement, that conspiracy, fanfic, this conspiracy that white people are being replaced in a move to eventually oppress them. Like, the author writing this didn't intend it that way. She thinks she's helping white people learn racism is bad while also condemning race and, you know, the notion that race and beauty are tied together. She thinks it shows empathy and builds empathy to show this world where white people can imagine oppression. She doesn't know that that world, you know, already kind of exists, that, and so much of her book empowers the idea. Like, again, we can't and shouldn't raise pitchforks against her for this decade-old, really offensive blunder, but we can't read her excuses and just forgive her. Like, death of the author has flaws, and it also has perks, and I'm a big fan of, like, the author lives next door, and you can ask if you want, but it's a bit of a bother. Author's intent adds a lot of context, but reader's immediate takeaway is always going to be what matters first. Few people are going to bother seeking out that context if it isn't in the text itself. Some people are better at reading text, like for example people who can't spot sarcasm in things might have trouble with reading comprehension, and saying somebody lacks reading comprehension isn't necessarily an insult because it is a skill, some people aren't taught it or don't foster it, and so if they read a text they might miss a uh, meaning that is not too clear. It becomes a tricky issue to then define what is clear enough, because subtlety exists, but it does lead to a lot of cases where people look at a um, satire or parody and believe it is entirely honest, especially cases where they might feel then empowered like by it. For example, um, there's a TV show called The Boys, which I hugely love, and um, one of the main villain characters is Homelander, and Homelander is very much a satire, um, the whole show has a lot of satire elements to it, it's very it's very much making fun of the whole persona of Homelander, who is a sort of very nationalistic, kind of becomes a Nazi, but um, in a slightly different way than the traditional Nazi. It's parodying a lot of very stuff, and I can't explain the whole plot of the show. But the main point is that this guy is a really bad villain Nazi who does a lot of horrible things, while also clearly supporting a lot of horrible viewpoints. However, there are people who look at him, and even though they are like, well, he's the villain in the show, they agree with him, and they don't realize that he is making fun of them. And I think that, in some cases, this parody is very obvious, and people just are lacking comprehension, but in other cases, if they're 
first interpretation is to think that it is entirely serious or to read something entirely wrong, there is some worth in thinking, yeah, there might be something up with the text then. So the author is dead in that way. If your first takeaway is completely wrong from what the author intended, the author's intent doesn't necessarily matter. Very few people are going to go and do the research to actually look what the author intended. I don't have a lot to say on this, but I felt I had to mention it. In my digging around, I found Save the Pearls has a website, and the website is oddly still online. It's not being updated, though the last update was weirdly in 2019, I have no goddamn idea why, but it's online, and the reason I say online is so weird is because you have to pay for the internet. It's a domain name, somebody is paying to keep this domain up for god knows what reason, considering the author has abandoned these books. It was supposed to be a trilogy, there is no book three, we're never gonna see book three. And on this website, the author roleplays her own characters in a forum, often talking to people I'm not sure are there, and rambling both in and out of character freely. It's hard to tell if the blog is canon or not. It semi-acts as a prologue, but it's also very aware of the fact that it's this meta-fiction, it's this side blog thing. The author, as Eden, keeps talking about young adult fantasy romance and a romantic apocalypse, promoting the book in every post by the end. Um, here's one such post, for example. So I was feeling down for a little bit after hearing about the latest Pearl disappearance, still haven't heard anything new by the way, which led me to beating myself up a little bit. I lost track of Save the Pearls campaign because I had butterflies on my stomach because I thought I'd found the perfect mate. It seemed like my own fantasy romance was about to involve, unfold, and since we have no other choice as Pearls than to find a mate, I got a little focused on my own plight. Plus, it's fun. I want the whole love story, the ones they write about in Harlequin romance novels and young adult romance novels. Okay, so I read Harlequin romance novels when I was younger. That's all I could find on the bookshelf my mom left behind. Anyways, I'm back on my game. I can't help but check out all our new online dating profiles. Hello, Charmer171 and Thale. And that's just for starters. Because I do need to find the perfect mate so I can avoid the romantic apocalypse I'm facing. But I'm gonna do everything I can. I will save the pearls. Mark my words. She links to other posts throughout that, there's hyperlinks and a members page. Uh, members page, I again can't tell if it's real or fake. It has 11 pages of members, so there must have been real people signing up, maybe in like a newsletter way. But the author is the only person posting on this blog. Though also, the author has about five different blogs, one of them is Eden's blog, but then there's also one just about apocalyptic fiction, young adult romance, um, survival tips. She has several different blogs, but they all are only clearly the author posting on them. So why would anyone sign up? Because it's not quite a newsletter, it's clearly a forum, but no one's allowed to post. And isn't it weird if the author is in character role-playing our main character treating members as dating profiles on an in-universe site? Searching the long archive, you can then find links to a whole fake news website, which is offline and hasn't been archived on the Wayback Machine. The links appear to be news articles on missing pearls, and Eden muses the YouGov is obviously killing or taking pearls in secret. This is something that's not canon to the book, where Eden confidently says pearls who don't mate are just marooned from resources and left to die. Yet here, it's a whole conspiracy. Another new layer the website introduces is regarding Eden herself. Almost every post she refers to, she says her Save the Pearls campaign, which later becomes her talking about the Save the Pearls book, meaning Eden apparently wrote the whole book we now enjoy. This isn't something clear in the book and is only on the website, and the book is written in third person, which is a very weird choice if we're meant to think of it as autobiographical. And of course, famously, Eden, in the book, just doesn't care about saving the pearls at all. Eden isn't a campaigner, and has no broad ideas of justice or revolution. She doesn't care about the pearls, and she only cares about herself. Literally, in book two, she says out loud she doesn't want to go back to the like the tunnels to help other pearls, and would rather stay in the jungle forever with Bramford. Like, she says this. Let's make one thing clear, she said. I'm not going to sacrifice you or myself for the greater good. I don't care about the fate of the pearls or the rest of the world. I only want to be with you. Which is... A very bold take for a heroine of a young adult dystopia to make. And then when you poke around the site, it only gets weirder. It's very hard to tell, but it does appear every public 
facing posts is the author role-playing as her own characters, mostly Eden. There aren't any comments on any of the posts, though the last one, for some reason from 2019, has a note saying that comments are off for it and it alone. Like, what's going on here? Why are there so many blog posts that no one has read? And like, who's paying for this? On the Wayback Machine, you can even see the avatars, and it's her using like stock images, kind of, for say, Jamal. And then Jamal is making a post promoting how good Save the Pearls is selling. Why is the villain making a post about how good the book that is maybe real or not real it's very strange. And then when you look at Eden's avatar, um, Eden's avatar at first looks like a girl with dark hair until I realized it was from the book trailer, which yes, there is a book trailer for this. It is pretty much gone from the internet, but you can kind of find a little bit of it. I told you the end was coming and here it is. One week from today, I turn 18. I'm still not made it. You know what that means. I have one hope left, and it depends on you. I'm counting on you to read my story and spread the word. I'm calling it Revealing Eden. In this, I tell everything. All my secrets, my apocalyptic fears, my romantic hopes, even the betrayal that I suffered. And you will want to read it even if it scares you. I may not be around anymore to meet with you like this, but at least I'll leave knowing that my story has been finished. And since it reveals so much, you can be sure that they will try and stop it. Get it right away before they make it disappear, just like me. Help me save the pearls. Read Revealing Eden before it's too late. I'm going to share like one more blog post though, just for fun, because I just want to give you more of a taste of what this bizarre website is. So this is a post called Girl's Survival Guide for the Apocalypse World. Let's face it, there are so many solutions we've got to come up with like right away. We're going to have to adapt to an apocalypse world in many more ways than guys do. And if you're lucky enough to find a mate, it's going to be even tougher. Trying to keep the fantasy romance alive in your relationship will be tough, if not impossible. Sounds like we've got some serious brainstorming to do at our next Save the Pearls meeting. Obviously, we're weaker and smaller than most dudes. On top of that, we're high maintenance. We got more physical issues to learn to live with. For example, what about body hair? While guys welcome a vacation from shaving and sometimes even look hot with a beard, girls don't get too psyched about having hairy legs and armpits. Except for the hippie chicks, anyway. Thought, uh, though I'm trying, though I'm starting to think hippies are just fictional characters from science fiction and fantasy novels. There are rumors that laser hair removal can permanently remove hair. That sounds perfect for protecting the shelf life of your fantasy romance. I've also heard that intense pulsified light, or IPL, is cheap and fast, but just not as effective as laser. You could always get one of those old school epilator things though, as they'll be very hard to find in an apocalyptic world. Plus, you won't really be able to use it as much, as they'll be way more important uses for your batteries. A Save the Pearls member is selling these tiny pairs of scissors that you trim away the heaviest areas of hair. That might do the job to keep the fantasy and adventure alive in your relationship. Ultimately, it would be rad if guys would just learn to love us for who we are, oblivious to our hairiness. I mean, look at how hair they are. So that's an absolutely wild and bad post. Oh my god, I this is 2012, so maybe we were just that much backwards back then about body hair. But the concept of this girl, this girl, this grown woman, she was like 50 when this was happening, writing this blog post about how disgusting body hair is and how we're gonna have to do everything we can to get rid of it is, um... So just, I just really, I just really feel bad about, I don't know how I feel, uncomfortable, negative, bad, why did she write that? Like, am I dreaming? I mean, the final two posts on the site are the meta-breaking ones, where the author directly addresses the controversy of her book, and that gives us some choice insight. So here's her responding to some of the controversies of Save the Pearls. 
Some have taken offense at the cover photo on the dust jacket of a blonde, blue-eyed girl with her white face half covered in dark. Without reading the novel or understanding the premise, some believe the photo shows the girl in blackface. Nothing could be further from the truth. First, consider the basis of all prejudice is judging a book by its cover. To condemn any book on the basis of its cover is hardly different than condemning a total stranger because of the color of his or her skin. How can you critique or damn a book if you haven't read it? This kind of blind attack is exactly what creates racism or condemn many progressives as communists in the 50s. Revealing Eden is a sci-fi fantasy adventure romance, and while it is a work of fiction, the premise is all too believable in the face of extreme global warming. So yes, the book is meant to provoke the white community that has never experienced racism or been oppressed because they've been the majority in this country. The use of blackface presents a mockery or travesty of African Americans' lives. Eden wishes to Great Earth that she had dark skin, not because she wants to make fun of people of dark skin, but because she admires their status and is jealous of the genetic advantage they offer against the heat. Skin cancer. I highly respect all races and abhor racism. I sincerely hope that you will read Revealing Eden and grasp its message of love and hope for the planet and for all men. Yeah, so it's, um, it's really bad. Book two hits you with a sucker punch. The Aztec god Huitzipolichli, very rough pronunciation on that, is reflecting over the last Aztec tribe and musing that the only hope for the world is if Eden becomes a furry and has a good relationship with Bramford. This is a very drastic shift from the last book, which had no magical elements in it as at all, like as you'll recall. And I can't think of a bigger genre shift than a literal god showing up. It's never clearly established, but we later learn this isn't actually a god, but rather the leader of the last Aztecs, who is the sun god in the way that the Aztecs would sometimes worship certain people as a living embodiment of their gods. However, magic is still real, and the gods are probably, like, still real. Eden has long been foretold to these people, and there's some other magic sensing going on throughout, making this sun god POV a half-bait in Switch. It's also true that the POV is written as if he indeed was a god and is a god. He muses how mortals don't worship him anymore because the sun is a deadly laser, and how he misses the heyday of the 1960s when the Beatles wrote Here Comes the Sun, even though we understand this last Aztec tribe has been alive for thousands of years. Um, they've been so cut off from the world, why does he know Here Comes the Sun? And also, why is his heyday the 1960s when the Aztecs have long been wiped out except for this one tribe? Shouldn't your heyday be like when the Aztecs were doing... Anyways, after this bizarre start, we return to where we roughly left off. After the FFP found the village last book, everyone is moving to a new location elsewhere. Along to help are some of the Aztecs who saved the day last book, though they're still not characters and they don't have any dialogue really. At the start of book two, there's just a lot of recapping, but also rewriting certain events and backtracking to like cover plot holes and the racism accusations. This is where the author says that Cole was never a slur, but a compliment because Cole is so precious. And it's also how we learn like why the uh, Wurani are able to survive on the sun bleached surface of the earth where everyone else has been driven underground. The plant that saved Eden's dad like last book is evidently commonly eaten by everybody here and grants incredible health, including sun resistance. Considering all of the village and all of the Aztecs have been eating it for thousands of years, it sounds like we've just solved skin cancer, or probably all cancer, like just grow this plant and bring it to the rest of humanity. Yet the solution is dismissed because humanity will just destroy the rainforest or exploit it. I mean, humans do tend to do that. But also, if you just brought some samples back to a lab, you could grow it yourself in a greenhouse underground and create infinite amounts of this cure-all, like surely. You don't have to destroy the Amazon to get it. And also, in the most white person move of all time, this magical plant, used for generations of indigenous people in the Amazon, is dubbed and referred to as Newman's Cure by Eden, immediately. Like, like girl, I'm pretty sure it already has a name if you just bother to learn the language everyone, everyone around you is speaking. The village, and our heroes, journey to the Aztec's hidden village. Eden is bizarrely hateful of the Aztec during this process, in this confusing set of emotions that are never properly addressed. At the moment, Aztecs, like, save their lives from the FFP, and they're now trusting the Aztecs, you know, with their 
journey back there, the Aztecs are trusting these people with their secret safe haven out of like the goodness of their hearts. They're just very nice people. But Eden has this protagonist sense and just vibes that they're evil. It leads to her seeming extremely racist and prejudiced, like more so than usual. The village and our heroes journey to the Aztec's hidden village. Eden is bizarrely hateful of the Aztec during this process, and this confusing set of emotions are just never properly addressed. At the moment, the, e the Aztecs save their lives from the FFP, and the Aztecs are now trusting them with their secret safe haven, all of the goodness of their heart. But Eden has this protagonist sense, and just vibes that they're evil. It leads to her seeming extremely racist and prejudiced, like more so than usual. From her perch on Bramford's shoulders, Eden surveyed the small caravan ahead as it winded its way through the rainforest in somber silence. A ragtag group of homeless people guided by Jaguar Paw and Scroll Jaguar, a pair of circus freaks. 37. This is her internal thought process of just two men who are greatly helping her and her friends. Like, geez, Jesus, like, geez, girl. Oh well, I mean, we do get to have another horny piggyback ride to just cleanse the palate. Bramford carried her away into the thick shadows. Now his hands pressed into her thighs like hot irons, communicating his desire. Eden rubbed her legs up and down his torso until he groaned. Like moss to a flame, her hand slid towards his mouth. His warm, rough tongue licked her fingers, giving her a crazy jolt. 38. They arrive at the village, and Eden's sixth sense of always being right just continues. She meets the sun god priest, and feels like he has a paralyzing evil gaze, and is horrified by the sight of skull spikes, which she says seem to be haunted by the sad voices of the dead hovering in the shadows. They walk into a lovely village, but when she sees the people, she notes mostly how desperate they look, and kind of makes a dig about how they're definitely all inbred. Again, these are just people who are helping her, who have only ever helped her, yet Eden judges every single aspect blindly. In another book, maybe this would be set up for her to learn about cultural differences, but in this one it's just forgotten. Eden and Bramford are separated, with Eden going to live with a girl named Yolatli and her mother, who both insist on calling Eden Sochi Philly. Again, I'm doing my best of the Aztec names, I'm not very good. Eden immediately dubs Yolotli Yolo? Also? Seriously? The girl's name reminded Eden of an ancient acronym, YOLO, you only live once, which also evoked her new Be Happy Now approach to life. If she privately dubbed the girl YOLO, perhaps the nickname would remind Eden to let go of her fears. 65. Like in the last book, reaching this village halts much of the plot, but rather than be filled with vague nothings, this book fills the dead time with them. <sighs> homoerotic nude bathing? And by homoerotic, I mean insanely homo and insanely erotic. I slowly became convinced it was on purpose, there's just no straight explanation for what's going on here. By the final description, I very much thought the author was on purpose, indeed, taking this book in a bisexual poly twist, which is a wild thing to assume, but was just the only possible explanation. I'm gonna read a lot of quotes now, and I wanted to make it clear that this is not sex, this is not sexual, this is culturally accepted platonic sauna bathing, definitely, definitely nothing else going on here. Her soft hand slid down Eden's back. The caress tra traveled the sides of her legs and back up again, leaving Eden awash in contentment. Yolo turned Eden around to face her. The top of her head barely reached Eden's chin. Dark lashes framed velvety doe eyes that turned up to meet hers. She smiled as her hand slid across Eden's damp chest, circling her breasts. Eden's breath caught there, her heart frighteningly still. Yolo kept on touching her as if she really enjoyed it, as if Eden's white skin did not repulse her. As she bent down, her small, light hands roamed to Eden's hips and thighs with a delicate could see that made Eden shudder. She felt captive in the girl's embrace. Happily so. 87. Just last scene, Eden was grabbed by a guard and informed the reader that physical contact in the tunnels was outdated and she'd only ever even hugged her dying mother once. Brimford being the only person she's ever spent any real time touching. Now she's immediately naked steam ba bathing with Yolotli and... It's worth noting also that Eden doesn't speak anything other than English and never learns, so these two can only communicate physically and with about three words. But I mean, sure, you know, that wasn't 
that was a bit weird, but it wasn't like, you know, what do you mean homoerotic? What do you mean deeply erotic? What do you mean deeply homo? I'm reading into this. No, 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 no. There's much more. There's so much more. Starting with the fact that that chapter ends with Eden call saying YOLO can call her Sochipili, the goddess of love, and just like, sure, you can call me that. And then it fades to black. And they wake up the next chapter spooning in bed. And when YOLO starts to wake, Eden asks that she not move because she's just so comfortable spooning. And Eden calls her her girlfriend? Like, please enjoy the actual quote, though, for a nice sucker punch punchline to just remind you what book we're reading. She had always longed for a sister, but having a girlfriend was the next best thing. And a dark-skinned girl, too. Imagine that. 69. Nice. At this point, I went back to double-check Yolotli's age and first appearance and was surprised to find this. The girl must have been about 14 or 15. Her pert breasts jutted against her sleeveless, saffron-colored blouse, which set off her warm brown skin. The girl suddenly stole a look at Eden. The excitement in her soft brown eyes was both contagious and confusing. 59. It's just so fruity. And age-wise, yeah, it's a bit rough. Eden is still 17, and the age gap of 14 to 17 is a lot at that age, but they could conceivably be in high school together, okay? Let's just get back to more girlfriend, gal pal, platonic hot steam baths, which are very no homo, very no homo. And let's do a, let's do a bunch of them in a row, in fact. The scented mist swirled between them like a genie let out of a bottle. Her new friend closed the gap, her body brushing against Eden's. 68. Making an awkward effort, Eden pulled Yolo back into an embrace, their breasts nestled together like a pair of dove's wings. 72. Eden peered through the puffs of steam that swirled around Yolo's slender, dark body like exotic veils. The willingness in her soft brown eyes, like a doe greeting the sunrise, touched something deep inside of Eden. What had she done to deserve such a good friend? The endless devotion didn't seem to weigh on Yolo either. She seemed to enjoy it. Little by little, they came to understand each other's signals and create their own unique language. Now, Yolo stretched out on the floor besides Eden with an enticing purr that reminded her of the feline sounds Bramford made. 93. So nothing fruity going on there, no? No? <laughs> nothing fruity? Okay, just to sort of throw in the last one, the bit that genuinely made me believe for a few pages Yolo and Eden were having some sort of sexual relationship. I'm not naive. I'm not gullible. I was just confronted with the following and I had no other explanation for what the author was describing except lesbian sex. And I don't think you'll disagree is the thing. But her friend seemed to know her better. She sat up and leaned over her, her long brown hair sweeping across Eden's chest. Yolo brushed her soft hands over Eden's eyelids, closing them. And because Yolo often gave her the same instructions, Eden understood. Relax. As if Yolo's job was to keep her calm and happy. She massaged Eden's shoulders until her worries faded with a long exhale. Slowly, Yolo's hands moved across her breasts, taking a sweet, torturous path to her hips and thighs. It worked. Eden fell back into a stupor of bliss. Funny how shy she had been about her nakedness. Now, she reveled in it. Her languid body hung on the edge of intense anticipation, the dance between relaxation and desire heightening both extremes. She didn't even register the grunt outside until it became a growl. Yolo whispered urgently a word that indicated it was Bramford. 95. Am I wrong? Like... Am I wrong? Am I wrong? Like, how do you pick words like that? Like, languid desire? How do you pick words like that and not intend it to definitely be a fingering scene? Like, what is going on? As if to desperately cling to heterosexuality, we're then immediately met with the most sexually explicit piggyback ride yet. Which, again, no sex is happening. This is literally just her riding on his shoulders as they run through the jungle. Please. That is all that's going on here. I'm not lying to you. Believe me, not sex, not sex at all. This is a piggyback ride, okay? He pressed his hot hands onto her bare thighs. His rolling shoulders kneaded her flesh. Leaning forward, Eden rode him fast. She drove her hips into him, her breasts rubbing against his head. Pleasure whipped through her as she moaned his name. His savage cry sent a shudder through her. 97. Again, casual piggyback ride. Nothing else? Nope, nothing else, nothing else at all. Okay, I've sort of forgotten to explain the plot 
in amidst all of this not sex sex stuff, and honestly, it doesn't matter. Eden is due to become a furry, but it's delayed. Everyone calls her Sochi Pili, the goddess of love, even though Sochi Pili is a man who literally has a female counterpart with a different name, who is the goddess of love. The Aztecs have arranged Eden and Bramford be married, as they believe the balance between love and war is uneven, and Bramford represents war, and thus their marriage will fix this. As expected, the stakes, motive, and general plot are very poorly defined and often contradictory. So on the date of their wedding slash the furry transformation, Yolo drinks something and seems very sleepy and odd, and gets taken to the top of the pyramid as villagers clamor to touch her and carry her. Eden can't figure out what's going on at all, and seems to just think she's popular, until Yolo is placed on the sacrificial stone slab. As much as she's horrified and upset by the fact that Yolo is being sacrificed as part of her, like, wedding to Bramford, she does nothing and watches as Yolo is killed. Multiple times as she's sacrificed, Yolo's virginity is emphasized as if like a personal attack on how much gay sex she was definitely having with Eden. Also, of course, it should be said, there's no link between virginity and sacrifices in Aztec culture that we know of, especially since our sources on the Aztecs are almost all from the viewpoint of Spanish colonizers, who are often just plain lying about their practices. As Yolo dies, we get the worst punchline of all time, which honestly just cycles back into being really funny. How cruel a nickname Yolo now seemed. You only live once. 115. After this, Yolo has a, like, Eden has a dream where Yolo shows up, speaking English, and says that she died for love and she's happy. So that's cool. Uh, Eden kind of doesn't matter after this point, or is really mattering objectively beforehand, like, like, bless you, YOLO. You know, you were gay and you died carrying the flame for a bitch you didn't even catch on in the slightest. Uh, here's another great punchline for all of this. Eden is considered to be the incarnation of Xochifili, who is, as covered, is a god, not goddess of love. And you know what else is Xochifili's domain? Gay sex. Anyways, it's furry time. I have so many quotes from this book, but like, how can I not? Eden gets transformed into her cat person form. Quite notably, this answers a question I had all along. Yes, Eden now has brown-black skin. Eden at this point no longer identifies as a pearl and is now darker than when she wore blackface, making her what I'm gonna call transracial. It's a very eye-catching term, it's not exactly a lie, and it'll look good in a thumbnail. She remembered how once the color of someone's skin had signified worth or importance. To her new way of thinking, each and every color had value. And then the question arose, what color was she? Eden glanced down at her arms and legs of a puzzled grunt. A shade or two off midnight, not as dark as her cousin, the black jaguar, more like dusky twilight. Why aren't I darker? she asked. It appears your recessive Caucasian genes modified those of the black jaguar more than I anticipated. 126 to 127. And, on the same subject, how could he have possibly known she was once a pearl? Eden was a dusky brown hybrid human, for Earth's sake, an immortal. If she had died and been reborn, she couldn't have been more different than the girl she once was. What traits still branded her as a pearl? 209. And also, just not even race-related, just bonus. Her brow was hard, strong enough to butt a creature to death. And her strong white teeth gleamed, the points had grown sharp as nails. Eden licked her full, sensuous lips, imagining them locked onto Bramford's. She was a thrilling, sexy she-cat. 132. Actually, just as I read that now and I think about it, I wasn't sure if I'd bring this up, but I think I will. Um, we don't have a description of Eden's lips before the transformation, if she had full, sensuous lips, but it kind of sounds like becoming a cat person has given her full lips, which is ridiculous as it stands, but once you also take into the account that she has sort of become transracial, her skin is now a d sort of dark bl brown black, the fact that she also has more thicker lips, which is a trait associated much more with people of color, particularly black people, that starts to get quite offensive, huh? We get a bit more plot. It seems like everyone is afraid of some great war, but it's entirely confusing, like what this war would even be. There's no war right now, there aren't any clear sides. The biggest conflict points in this world are probably pearls and coals, but pearls have absolutely nothing to fight with. Plus, our heroes are so out of the fight, they're living in the remote rainforest. Is it someone else versus the Aztecs? Because, like, who? There's no one else. Like, for all this talk of prophecy and Eden being foretold 
having to like best Bramford in some way. The threats are just so abstract, they're only confusing. Besides this, all of this plot is just a distraction from Eden and Bramford's sexy cat person marriage. First, they kind of butt heads a bit, as Eden is much more powerful than him because her father adjusted the transformation, and functionally accidentally made her an immortal god, whatever. Next, there's some inaccurate biology going on, which is huge pet peeve, with talk about how like the male of the species is meant to dominate, and Eden, being anything other than submissive, is upsetting and wrong, especially to Bramford. Like, this is... There are many kinds of animals in the world which have many different relationships with each other. That's a very broad statement to say. Um, but they're meant to be panthers, black leopards. Like most cats, they're solitary and they don't have particularly severe sexual dimorphism. The males often might be a bit bigger than the females, but that is pretty much it. They're mostly solitary except for when they get to mate. The males certainly don't dominate the females, and when it comes to social cats, you still have the same things where, um, you know, if you have a group of house cats, the males aren't automatically more dominant. You know, a lot of the times it's more on the individual cat. When you look at lions, the male of the pride, in some ways it appears like is the dominant, but the females are the ones who actually do everything. It's You can't really boil down relationships between animals and humans as being the same thing. It's sort of like the alpha mentality, which again, it's just based off of a very limited understanding of animal social structures and things like that. Humans aren't built to have a dominant submissive situation. Panthers also definitely do not have that. But this book is just sort of like, Bramford's upset because Eden's stronger than him and that's not natural. Once married, the two finally have sex. And it's worth pointing out the mention fact that marriage isn't even a thing in their society, by the way. Eden's parents were married, but Eden tells us that many people don't marry in the future, and it's just seen as old-fashioned. Despite this, we're reading a young adult book, and um, to teach good morals, we have to make sure that these guys are legally married before any sex can happen, as all young adult books require. Now, the sex scene is extremely funny and lies in that young adult zone of both being like too explicit, but also not mentioning too many explicit details or words. I would put the entire text in here if I could. I probably could. I mean, it's deeply tempting. And also, the less context I give, the more explicit it sounds. But then the more context I give, the more I'm just straight up reading a sex scene. And I don't quite know where my middle ground is there. And I think I'll just do some choice phrases and moments as my compromise, where I'm going to cut a lot of it out because it's actually very long, but it's also really funny. So um, look forward to the fact, uh, first of all, it's very unclear when Bramford has actually entered Eden. It's way later than you're going to think. And it's so clear when he has finished her. Well, finished with her. Bramford paused to untie his loincloth, she realized with a start. Her heart quickened at the shock of his warm, taut touch as he took her into his arms. They lay naked together, husband and wife. Her senses followed every inch he claimed, willing him to go on. Bramford slid beside her with a deep groan, her breath caught in her chest. Bramford pushed his weight into Eden, urging her to accept him. The last gasp of girlish fear flickered in her like the remains of the day. She wavered for a moment, knowing things would never be the same. Arching her back, Eden tightened her legs around his torso in clear invitation. Bramford measured his advance, matching her cautious rhythm, as he began to possess her. She sensed the control with which he mastered his urge, like holding back a tidal wave that would break over her if he let it. She nodded quickly, and, tilting her head to one side, exposed her neck. It was a signal that sent him over the edge. He clamped his jaws onto her neck, instinct driving his body now. She held on, her eyes wide but unseeing. Just when she feared their passionate dance might destroy her, Bramford cried out and released his energy. He sank into her with heartbreaking tenderness. Wrapped in his arms, Eden purred softly and stroked his back. 198, 199. So yeah, it's a whole two pages, and Bramford 100% does not give her an orgasm. It's even more clear in the full text. I mean, it's so clear, unclear, like, when he's fully in her, but goddammit do we know that he finished early in very specific detail. I'm kind of sorry about the amount that I put in to share. <laughs> Immediately after this sweaty, furry jungle sex scene, some white supremacists approach the sex cave. Side note, 
why is this the second book I've done now that has had a sex cave? There was one in Halo as well. Anyways, a whites-only terror group called the Marquis show up. Um, they didn't exist last book, but now they do, and they set off every red flag you could have, especially contrasted with the FFP. The FFP had a logo of a white dot being destroyed by a black whirlpool, very sinister, but the Marquis have a fancy Victorian lettering M that harkened back to when white men had ruled the earth. That's an exact quote. Yeah, like, these are definitely modern-day white supremacists. Yet, and funny thing, I wonder if you can imagine this, the book treats them very differently than their equivalent FFP. Both groups are terrorists who want to eliminate the other race, but while the FFP was a threat to be dealt with immediately, with generic baddies harassing our heroes, like, never named, the Marquise has named members who are to be talked to. Eden literally stops Bramford from attacking them by shouting their pearls as at him, like, as a sign that they're harmless and even sympathetic. The leader of the Marquise is a kindly-looking man, and his second command is so good-looking he's literally called an archangel with his blonde hair and blue eyes. Hmm. The book very mildly lampshades this, with a flashback where Eden's mother tells her that while the Marquis seems sympathetic because they're also pearls, any hate group is wrong. But the book still treats them differently than their counterparts. It's not just Eden, it's the narrative. The Marquis have the expected villain betrayal, but even then it's only one member, with the leader still being a kindly white man who should be saved and trusted. The group as a whole is not painted by one evil member two evil members even, because Rebecca is there. Rebecca, Bramford's dead mate, is actually alive and with the Marquise, and she's... she's here because, um, this is a real plot point. If it wasn't for the fact that, um, YouTube might hit me for certain phrases, I guess, I would put this at the start of the video as an introduction to just everything we're about because, gosh, this is the plot point. The white supremacist cave to the sex cave to deliver our heroes Bramford's brother's suicide note, because after the internet had got a hold of the fact that furries had been invented, the black-white race war began in earnest. I haven't mentioned Bramford's secret brother, because he's in maybe like one or two brief scenes last book, and he's very important, like, unimportant, like, before and after he dies. He has a secret half-brother. That's it. He commits suicide. That's it. Rebecca is here to reconnect with Bramford. To remind you of her crimes, she was working with the FFP to steal Bramford's research, despite being a pearl herself, and conceived an albino son with him, who has had, like, one mention in this book, by the way. After this, she abandoned her son, but wound up held captive by the FFP, who tried to trade th the son for her life. At this point, it was assumed she died, as Bramford refused. Now she's back as some sort of strange romantic threat, despite the fact that she's horrible and everyone hates her. Bramford's last book says their whole relationship was basically just because he hooked up with her when he was 15 and she got pregnant, so they became official mates because he just was like, it's about time I get a mate. She betrayed him and their son, but suddenly he seems affectionate for her? And most confusingly, he honors the idea that she has any right to their son. Like, I felt like I was being gaslit by the book at this point. A lot of the Rebecca story is confusing and ill-defined, a lot of her motives don't make any sense, but it definitely appears that she abandoned her son for maybe seven years and is also a terrorist. Yet when she reappears, Bramford kind of grumbles how powerless he is to let her, you know, not see the son. Like, dude, you're a ripped cat man. She left you and your son. She's in two terrorist groups. You're in the Amazon rainforest, you do not have to honor her custody rights. And as we start crashing into the end of the book, like, the plot just starts to earnestly lose its mind. Rebecca and Bramford seem to be bonding again, which Eden spies on with this hot white supremacist. Said white supremacist rubs blood on his lips to trick Eden into licking it off of his mouth, thus making Bramford think Eden was cheating on him. This makes Bramford fairly convinced he should let Rebecca become a furry and raise his son. And reminder, this is also like the day after their wedding. The evil Marquise man, who by the way is named Kirby, works with Rebecca to abduct Bramford back to the tunnel so they can steal the furry jeans, and Eden just sort of watches powerless. As one of the final moments of the books, all the Aztecs are suddenly withered and sickly because of, I think, a world-breaking amount of poor writing stupidity. I don't even know what's going on here. It was as if an enchantment had worn off, leaving everyone old and withered. The miraculous effects of Newman's cure erased? And yet, Eden felt stronger than ever. 
Her father might have put forth Einstein's theory of relativity as an explanation. Time crawled in this hidden place compared to the warp speed of the tunnels. The collision of the two worlds, one stuck in the past and the other lost in the future, had brought their space-time continuums into alignment with devastating results. In other words, whether the magical effects of the plant had vanished because of the modern world's intrusion, or simply because the Aztecs believed its arrival, along with the death of the astrologer, gave evidence to the god's wrath, their world was dying. 293. Yeah, um, whatever's going on there, which, it's obviously magic because there's been vague magic throughout, but the sudden, clearly relativity makes, it doesn't make any sense here. I, I can't even, like, say that sarcastically. This makes no sense at all. It's so ridiculous and weird and just hits you at the back of the book just like a little slap as you go out because the book ends with an ad for book three, Freeing Eden, which we will never see it. Perfect. So now we've covered the plot of both books, I'm going to go into a couple extra things before we wrap up, and I also want to give a um, shout out to my horrible room that I film in, because I'm aware that my lighting again is kind of nice. For a long period there, I went deeply into it being absolutely horrible, and um, I appreciate everybody's suggestions about my lighting situation. The absolute truth, and this is completely honest, is that we have, um, I want to say like eight foot tall windows with even taller yellow curtains. The overhead light, which is almost always broken, is deeply yellow. And I live in England, so a storm passes over and suddenly my lighting completely disappears no matter what time of day I film it. I'm doing my best, and you know, one day, if you keep supporting me, maybe I'll move to a different flat where I can actually set up lighting. A bit more world dunking. That's where we are. So I've already covered how broken most entities in this world are in regards to motivation. In particular, the YouGov, which both mandates more population, but also has a strict coal of those who don't pick somebody to bone. There's another small detail about the YouGov that makes their motives and goals even more broken. One small, randomly placed detail that perfectly sums up everything wrong with this world building. Back in the tunnels, this is a quote, Back in the tunnels, conception was never left to chance. If a woman didn't conceive naturally within three months, the health department implanted her womb with a pre-made embryo. A special class of cold donors selected for the best genes provided the eggs and sperm. So, let's just step backwards and break down what we know about the world and how this impacts that, okay? In this world, there is a race caste system, but the lowest, palest caste is not slaves, they're just low. You must mate by age 15, uh, 18, or 24, or you are killed. You are encouraged socially to mate up caste, but pearls, the lowest caste, are allowed to mate with others of the lowest caste. There is no penalty for that. Four, the government has used eugenics before to fully wipe out albinism. So take this lore and consider how little sense failed pregnancies get free ideal embryos is. It makes sense in some types of dystopia, but just doesn't work in what our rules are. So what is the goal of this government? If they want to protect pearls, they should probably fix the caste system. If they want to eliminate them, why not just murder them all? You know, they, they fully got rid of all the albinos. If they want to eliminate pearls, but you know, they want to do it slowly with eugenics, why let pearls reproduce among each other? We already know there's some rather clear eugenics going on in how pearls are very encouraged to mate up caste, as it were, just sort of, you know, removing the Caucasianness of the people. That is a form of eugenics. And similarly, when you can't conceive, you are implanted with a very specific kind of embryo. Again, it's enforcing eugenics by cutting off the genes of these, you know, the white people. So eugenics is going on. Why not just kill all the white people or not let white people mate with other white people? If they have a population crisis, why not force mating point blank if one fails to pick a mate by 18? Because right now, if you aren't able to find someone who's agreeing to have sex with you, you just are killed. Where if you have a population crisis, killing your population is not going to solve that. And rather being like, well, you didn't find anyone, here's a free embryo, or here's another undesirable person, just mate with them. If they're short on population, in fact, why is there a one-child-only rule? Like, do you guys want kids or do you want to limit the amount of kids? 
And similarly, again, if the government has perfect eugenic embryos, why not give those to failed mates or pearls or even everyone if that's what you're trying to get to? I mean, it just drives me a bit mad how absolutely broken the system is. There's just so many obvious ways to handle a post-apocalyptic society, and the book just picks all of them and none of them at once, and it just makes me want to destroy things. Also, Oxy. Oxy was mentioned once, maybe you caught it and just were like, when's that gonna come back? Let me tell you, Oxy's coming back. Everyone in the future is addicted to Oxy, or Oxycodone. It's a very strong opioid painkiller that exists today. We learn everyone is on Oxy at all times, with the YouGov even dubbing it the happy drug and prescribing it at least once a day. While Eden, when Eden is like especially stressed, she takes extra. And inexplicably, the main way to take Oxy is um, the Oxy cap. It's a special drug hat and I'm just obsessed with this thing. Trembling, she lay down and pulled the Oxy cap from its storage unit above her. The soft molded apparatus fit over her head. As it clicked into place, a tiny syringe slid out from its sleeve into the receptacle in her scalp. She flicked the dosage to high, a low moan escaping her. Hurry, Eden thought, desperate for the soft, numb kick to begin, page 20. We, again, have Oxy in the present day. It's taken via pill, obviously. It can be given via syringe, but that's pretty much only going to be at the hospital because whenever possible, it's best if people don't have to give their own syringes, because that can go badly. So we have pills for it, it's fine. A special hat is just so silly, like, why would you have a special hat for it? She's like lying in bed and has to take it from a storage container and just put a hat on. And also it says that she has a receptacle in her scalp, implying that she has a small hole in her head? That's never mentioned again. But a receptacle is rather like a, um, a cannula, like a, just a hole that goes into your body to put things in. In this case, the syringe. So I assume that the whole time is like a furry and everything, she just has a, a teeny little hole somewhere on her scalp. Anyways, why is there a hat? Is it to control the dose? Because Eden's the one who elects to take it and picks the amount. It seems like it's prescribed for everybody to have at least one a day, but she just can sit down here and be like, I need some more, and she gets more. I don't think I need to tell you how this is just a recipe for an overdose or hopefully how bad opioids are. I mean, they're great painkillers, but bad. They're quite negative in a lot of ways. I, I can tell you that for from experience because I have a chronic illness. I have a, a disability. I have a chronic illness that gives me the disability that they're, they're together. They're the same thing. And I have to take a hell ton of opioids, usually weekly. Um, yeah, opioid painkillers are not daily drugs or long-term drugs. Oxy is used for longer periods. It's a slow but strong one, and it's often given out of, like, surgery, for example. But you cannot remain on it for years. You can't remain on any of these things for years. Yet this society is apparently set up so that from a very young age, we have no information on that, so why not assume, everyone is on a dangerous, addictive drug that famously, like most painkillers, but, you know, especially opioid painkillers, loses power if you take too much of it consecutively. Like, the whole thing with opioid painkillers is that you keep taking the same dose forever, you'll eventually need more and more to get the same high, and the same painkilling effects. And that resistance doesn't move the bar on an overdose. This is why opioids can be so dangerous because you will wind up wanting more and more to both get rid of the pain, but also if you get addicted to it, the pleasant feeling that you get, the sort of high, the bar moves up so you have to take more and more pills to do that, but the overdose tier is set at a certain amount of pills and it becomes very easy to thus overdose on it, especially if you're very desperate for the high. That's why they are such tricky drugs. And I mean, the addiction side of things is famously horrible. Like, Eden, when she arrives in the jungle, is cut off from Oxy. She's been on Oxy for years, we're going to assume. Like, the cold turkey withdrawal of opioids, I can tell you from experience, is nightmarish, and it's worse the longer you've been on them. With these sorts of things, um, with the ones I take, for example, it's only three consecutive days that you start getting a risk for any amount of withdrawal, and the withdrawal is horrible. If you went on opioids for years and then suddenly went off them, you 
probably would die. I don't think we have a case study of that, but we do know that withdrawal, whether or not it's not the withdrawal necessarily itself that kills you, but your body just goes through such hell that it will trigger something else to kill you. It absolutely can. If Eden's been on them her whole life, or even for a lot of years, her body just wouldn't be able to cope without them. Even when you slow a dose down, if she was to take a measured down one, you still get horrible withdrawal. I'm just, I'm on a lot of medications, uh, so inaccuracy in books about them is such a peeve for me. Like, the ridiculousness of Oxy in this book is more funny than anything else. I thought I'd just throw in some fun facts for people who aren't really aware of opioid painkillers, I guess, but it's so ridiculous to see it portrayed like this and be this society where instead of just making up a fictional happy drug where you can just pretend like, ah, oh, it doesn't have withdrawal, it's fine, she just used a real one today. <laughs> that makes it so impossible. And also she invented a drug hat, and I was, I was really into the drug hat, actually. Um, I, maybe I, it'd be kind of fun if, you know, every time I had to take some painkillers, I'm, you know, dying on the floor somewhere, and then I gotta put on my special little hat and wait. <laughs> Writing style. Vaguely alluded to by all of my many, many quotes in this review, the writing in this book is bad. Specifically, it's very often obnoxious, and I couldn't, like, end the review without taking a second to just specifically mention it. This will be a short section. Eden knows every scientific name for every animal and plant, so pretty much once a page, one of those is taking up room, sometimes multiple times in a paragraph. It's just something you skim over. It's meant to be like a character trait of hers where she's, I guess, meant to be intelligent. But certainly that she grew up in this lab environment, her dad is, you know, such a lab man that she just knows all the scientific names. But when you're actually reading it, it is the most annoying trait because you just skip over it. I'm sorry, I'm not interested in reading a bunch of really specific classifications of animals. And um, it's so irritating. Eden, in general, has a deeply irritating voice, even without her, like, constant racist narration. We can just put the racism away. Her voice is just so annoying because she just constantly is shifting her emotions and the world pretty much multiple times, a, like, paragraph, it feels like. The prose itself, repetitive, bland, it's just only spiced up by very occasional bizarre similes. And even then, there's very few of those. Almost no one actually speaks or matters besides Eden and Bramford, leading to a fairly large supporting cast, which is so forgettable, I've gone away without mentioning or naming most of them. Eden's dad is one of the few who appears often, but is exceptionally just irking himself. I mean, he calls Eden Dot the entire time, short for daughter, and has this persona of maybe like a misremembered concept of what an autistic man is. For all the ridiculous content, most of these books are just very boring. They go by, but it's like a slog that just took me a very long time to get through. And even though I really was excited in my own way to see things like Eden transform or what the weird sex would be, opening up the ebook was just always this exasperating circumstance. Like, no one should have to deal with a book this poorly conceived of, constructed, written, handled. Like, as I always say with books, I don't want to co-op the nostalgia critic thing here, but like, I'm reading these so you don't have to. It's great when people have read them and can give like, their own thoughts on the subject. But honestly, I really don't recommend reading these books. I will say if I recommend reading a book, and this one it's like, no, don't do that. What even are these books? I feel like I've said enough at this point that a conclusion is just pointless. We we've been through it all together. Hot, sexy furries worshipped by indigenous people as they forget racism exists in the pristine Amazon rainforest, in a world where the sun gives instant skin cancer to people hundreds of feet underground. Save the Pearls is self-published and we shouldn't know about it. It obviously wasn't looked at by someone who wasn't paid or a family member. That's how we got this far and that's what went wrong in the end. It's horrible and ridiculous and there's so much and just so little to say. I have so many spare notes and I don't even know what including them would add. Like, how much can it help if I talk about Kevin, the mixed-race teen who joins both terrorist group and becomes Eden's adopted brother despite vague romantic vibes? Like, should I mention again that Bramford abandoned his son to live in a shack in the Amazon his entire life? And that said son only speaks like a handful of times both books? I mean, what about that dog who died and then lived and then died and then lived 
and then was not mentioned again. I mean, do you know how wildly wrong every aspect of the Aztec religion and culture was in this book? Or could you just guess that? Like, I don't know. I'm, I don't really know. I mean, there's so much more to this book than the obvious racism. And yet there is not a single thing that unifies it and like, just lets me end this. By the way, hey, I've gone a bit out of the habit of doing a sort of post credit sort of thing, but I wanted to just jump in here for people who don't necessarily read the descriptions. I have a Discord server now, which has been a really chill, fun place. A lot of you guys have seen me making the community posts where I advertise it, and I was limiting entries. At this point, um, I'm no longer limiting entries, so like, come on by, check it out. It's been really cool and fun so far, and one part of it that I think is like, especially maybe good, that this sounds a little pompous for you to be like, especially maybe good. But for example, with Save the Pearls, I actually did a live blog, as it were, on the Discord channel of that. And I kind of intend to do that for a lot of my future reads. So while the end review is of course a lot more comprehensive, it might be just a bit fun to see a lot of the things that I have to cut out because it just doesn't work or um, get to sort of go on this wild journey in real time with me. In addition, it's just, Kind of a cool way to do things. I try to read comments and respond to comments, but at this point I get a huge amount of them and I also get a lot of messages just on my various social media things and emails. I often lose things or don't get to see them, so the Discord is one of the best ways at the moment to kind of contact me if you want to say something. Uh, anyways, thank you so much for watching um, and reading and living and all of those sorts of things. Uh, I don't really have a lot of e extra things to kind of close off this, just letting you know, Discord's there. Uh, again, I'm on Tumblr at crow-caller. That's the main way that I social media. I don't really go on my Twitter anymore, which is AM Blaushield. I also publish some young adult books myself under um, AM Blaushield as my uh, name, which will be in the credits, but I thought I'd mention it. So if you like sort of a funky angels and a lot of really LGBT themes and characters and things. That's sort of just my specialty. That's what I write. I quite like doing so. So I'd appreciate you now checking it out. Thank you very much.